Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the Proximus Q1 2021 conference call. For your information, this conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to Nancy Gosen, Director of Group Investor Relations. Please go ahead. So, welcome everybody. As usual, we will start by an introduction by the CEO, uh, Hyun Boutin. And after this introduction, we will go to your questions. The participants on our side for the Q&A are Kathleen van der Weyer, the CFO AI, Jim Castele, the Chief of the Consumer Segment, Anne-Sophie Lotgering, the Chief of the Enterprise Segment, the CTO Geert uh, Standaard, the CEO of BIX, uh, Matteo Gatta. And so they will all be uh, very happy, no doubt, to take your questions in a moment. But first, we will turn the word to Guillaume for his introduction. Please go ahead. Thank you, Nancy. Good afternoon to, to you all and good morning to those joining from the U.S. Welcome to our webcast on the first quarter results. Let me go through some of the key achievements over the first quarter of 2021. During the first quarter, Belgium set up its COVID-19 vaccination campaign. And I'm very proud that Proximus is playing a crucial role in this, in this by, by equipping the various vaccination centers in the country with telecom and IT infrastructure, as well as advanced IoT solutions to monitor the temperature of the vaccines. Commercially, we are keeping a strong momentum, proving that our continued efforts, especially around our brands, are paying off. Specifically, the consumer segment is showing solid continued growth with especially high traction for higher value offers. On the enterprise segment, we are carefully managing the transformation, moderating the financial impact of legacy services decline, and gaining in more strategic areas. But I will come back to this in a moment. In parallel, we continue the execution of our inspired 2022 strategy, aiming at structurally transforming Proximus towards sustainable growth. We are well underway with regards to our ambition to build the best gigabit network for Belgium, doubling our fiber rollout speed in the first quarter. We have launched our 5G innovation platform to allow our B2B customers to explore the full potential of this technology. As for our ecosystem strategy, we already made significant progress. We launched our partnership with Signpost to enter the edtech sector, we launched Ads and Data, an ecosystem aiming at creating scale for the advertising at local level. Or lastly, we soft launched Beats, our telco in banking offer sold in selected Belfius channels. From a financial perspective, the COVID-19 crisis clearly still impacted our results negatively. Yet, we do see that the effect on the year-on-year -year variance is starting to moderate a trend we expect to further improve over the next quarter. Overall, our first quarter results are on track with our expectations, and hence we can reiterate the guidance we set for 2021. But let's take a closer look at some of these realizations. Let's start with our operational trends. As you can see on the graphs, the start of the year was in line with previous quarters, showing continued operational success. Our growing customer base remains a key revenue driver, especially as we are focusing our efforts on high-value customers. Besides growing our mobile and internet bases, we see continued growth of our TV base, adding 13,000 TV subscriptions over the first three months of the year. Our high-value customer growth is, of course, re relying on a proven conversion track record. Specifically, our convergent customer base increased by 21,000 over the first three months of the year, meaning that we managed to grow the segment of customers characterized by a higher than average RPC, a lower churn, and a very promising NPS. As a result, our convergent revenue grew by 2.7% and resulted in an overall growing ARPC. This growth in conversions was again well supported by our flex range. Over the first quarter, we attracted no less than 160k customers to one of the flex offers. And this was a mix of new customers and migration of existing customers from legacy offers. Flex is really answering changing customer needs. 
and that is what is making it continued success. There is less and less appetite for a fixed voice line, which is reflected in the fixed line erosion that you can see on the graph. But there is a growing appetite for multimobile and other value-added services. Lastly, you know that we pursue a strong gigabit connectivity strategy with fiber and 5G because it allows us to provide the best connectivity in Belgium. We already see very encouraging results of this strategy with growing appetite for fiber offers. At the end of the first quarter, we had a total of 77,000 fiber customers within our consumer segment. We see that in the zones where we deploy fiber, the commercial drivers like churn rate reduction and ARPC uplift are well on track with the ambitions we have. We expect, of course, this trend to accelerate rapidly as we progress on our coverage in the coming months and years. As I said before, we have been making good progress on our ambition to rapidly expand the reach of our fiber offer. Our weekly rollout increased to an average of 6,100 ohm past, which is more than doubling, doubling the pace of deployment since Q1 last year. We have been bringing fiber to an additional 73k homes and businesses over the first quarter of this year. In March, we passed 533,000 homes and businesses with fiber, meaning we are close to a coverage of 9% of all premises of the country. And this is just a start. As we have announced, we will further increase our rollout speed in the coming quarters. Following our announcement to partner with Equity, a new company was created called Fiberclar. Fiberclar plans to get started this year in about 10 Flemish cities and municipalities and has the ambition to pass at least 1.5 million homes in Flanders by 2028. As for the fiber partnership in Wallonia, with your fiber, we expect the clearance before the summer. Between our own rollout, Fiberclar, and the GV yet to be launched in Wallonia, we are fully on track to realize our ambition to pass 4.2 million homes and businesses throughout Belgium by 2028. As for our enterprise segment, we announced last year a multi-year transformation. Our aim is to become the preferred partner for the digital transformation for enterprises, allowing us to return back to profitable growth for our B2B segment as of 2023. Last year, we elaborated on our plan to that end, and the execution is well on track showing initial results. First, we want to transition towards telco ICT convergence solutions with a specific focus on higher profitability customer segments. We also want to accelerate the growth on the profitable services that we currently sell on the back of our telco ICD products. Second, we'll take advantage and monetize our superior gigabit connectivity. We just talked about fiber, of course, but also 5G. For example, we have recently launched a dedicated 5G co-creation platform to support our professional customers in exploring the full potential of this technology through specific use cases. And our customers are already showing massive interest, resulting in a strong commercial pipeline and a lot of co-creation with our clients and partners. Thirdly, we have a lot of progress ahead to create the best user-centric digital experiences, combining slick inter interfaces, redesigned journeys, automation, and personalization. The first results are really encouraging, as we have already seen the last, in the last month an increasing adoption of our self-service tools and digitalization of customer interactions. Let's take a look at the results of the first quarter more specifically now. From the first quarter results, it's clear that the enterprise segment is holding up quite well, with the revenue decline mitigated to minus 1.2%, despite the challenging operating environment. We actually grew our core telecom customer bases for fixed and mobile. By balancing volume and pricing, we have mitigated the structural headwinds from our legacy services. When we look at ICT, the story is a bit different. Over the past quarters, we faced some headwinds from COVID on our ICT business, with some delayed or cancelled ICT projects and constraints on delivery. But we see that COVID is also bringing structural opportunities in domains like virtual call centers, fixed mobile traffic, cloud computing, security, and collaboration software. 
As a result, we expect a restoring and positive trend will come with companies that will increase their IT spend to support an accelerated digital transformation. And this will create opportunities for consultative and managed services on top of the traditional telco and ICD products. Of course, the big question is timing. Some uncertainties remain, like impact of bankruptcies of company risk adver adverse behavior in coming months. But as we explained, we are investing the right convergent telco ICD products and services, and we saw this quarter with a growing share of higher value ICT. So we are confident that we will provide the right solutions to capture the benefits of a restored growth when it materializes. Moving now to the dom total domestic revenue for the first quarter, which was done by 1.7% with a comparable basis still tough for this quarter. As you see on the chart, the first three buckets we present our core service revenue that we invoice to customers, both for consumer and business segments. This includes mobile revenue, which was significantly impacted by lower roaming out traffic as a result of the COVID-19 related travel decrease. If we take out the roaming out revenue, or telco and ICT service revenue would have been up by 0.3% year over year. Another important driver of the domestic revenue decline was interconnect revenue at low margin. This decline, uh, at low margin, sorry. This decline represents a rapid change of behaviors in the way people and businesses are communicating since COVID times. And finally, we had negative roaming in impact for obvious reasons. This was for our domestic revenue. If we now take a look at TeleSign on the next slide. As we announce, we are now managing TeleSign and BIC separately, given that the two assets require different growth strategies. TeleSign sustained its very strong revenue performance with both programmable communication and digital identity services on the rise. With TeleSign revenue in US dollars, there are some forex effects that impacted the year-on-year -year variance. When we eliminate, eliminate these effects by applying a cost, constant currency, Telescience revenue grew by, 43, by almost 44% in the first quarter. Of course, it is essential to fuel this growth with the necessary investments. In line with our previous announcements, the company has been investing in attracting the right skills to strengthen, among others, the go-to-market and the R&D domains, which will, in turn, generate even more growth in a booming sector. For the big segment, so now excluding TeleSign, the sanitary crisis was still playing a significant role in this quarter, especially as we are comparing to a quarter which was virtually still unaffected by COVID. On top of that, the ongoing insourcing of services by MTN still had some additional negative impact, although the effect is gradually moderating. These two elements, which are of tempor temporary nature, overshadowed the otherwise quite resilient business trends of BICS. Especially in the core and growth domains, BICS resisted in a competitive market. The revenue from growth services, which includes cloud communication and IoT, was up by almost 13% year over year. And its core services, representing revenue from messaging, mobility, and infrastructure, was up by 7.2% year over year. A group EBITDA for the first quarter was 446 million euros, a 3.9% decline from the year before. This largely reflects three main elements. First of all, there is still a remaining impact of COVID-19 on our results. I talked about this before, and you see this especially reflected in the domestic and big direct margins. Secondly, the domestic expenses were higher, including some higher costs related to customer interaction calls and costs also linked to the good commercial momentum and fiber migrations. And thirdly, as we announced in framework of our guidance for this year, we have some higher costs related to our ongoing transformation plans for both our domestic operations and also, as I just explained, to boost the, the growth of TeleSign. Over the first three months of this year, we invested a total of 225 million euros with the timing of content contract renewals explaining why we, are, why we were slightly below last year. In line with our expectations and our rollout, 
the level of fiber investment increased and it is now representing 28% of our total CapEx envelope. Also, in line with our strategy, we stepped up investments in the area of digitalization and IT transformation. At the same time, we are rationalizing on CapEx for less strategic areas to maintain the overall envelope and prioritize strategic investments. This brings me to the free cash flow for the first quarter of this year, with a total of 143 million euros on a normalized basis. The chart shows you the different moving parts. I'd like to highlight that this includes the equity injections of, of, in the company FiberClar for 30 million euros. So in conclusion, we are on track with the execution of our strategy and our results so far are fully in line with our expectations. So we therefore reiterate our guidance for the year. With this, I've come to the end of my introduction and you can now go to your questions. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you have questions, you have to press 01 on your telephone keypad. The first question comes from Nicolas Colisson from HSBC. Please go ahead, sir. Hello, everyone. Uh, two questions, please. Uh, first is on the CBU. Uh, your co convergent RPU is down, I would say, sharply year on year. Uh, is it just a function of bundle mix from uh, 4P to 3P? Because if you could help us on getting the trends for the rest of the year, this would be very helpful, given the price increases slash roaming slash change in the mix, not very clear where we should land eventually. And my second question is about uh, having maybe a bit more indications on labor costs evolution into the coming quarters, because of, as you said, there will be a mix of uh, salary rises and workforce attrition. So if you can update us on the phase in between the rest of 2021 and 2022 to get to the uh, group targets eventually. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Jim, uh, Jim Castile for Consumer. So on the first question um, on the convergence RPC, so uh, I think what is important uh, first to note, of course, is that our overall um, RPC continues to increase uh, year over year by 0.4%. So we continue uh, to see a very nice growth of the convergent customer base, uh, which is generating a higher um, our average RPC of uh, 94 uh, euros um, and this higher mm -hmm. value mix uh, within our customer base is driving the overall uh, growth of RPC. Now, on the specific uh, drop of the trip on the convergent um, RPC, um, it's actually within the mix um, that we see um, that our convergent um, RPC um, is is um, is evolving. Um, we typically see that, um, and it's linked to the fixed voice uh, erosion. Um, that the, the bundles of um, internet, fixed voice, and mobile um, are, are declining, and these are typically uh, bundles with a, a bit of a higher um, IRPC than the average um, convergent IRPC. Uh, but when you look at uh, every s uh, specific IRPC um, within those different mixes, each of them is growing. So it's really the mix that is impacting, and that mix is linked to the, the fixed voice erosion that we see um, in the market. So I think what, what is important on our side is that we continue uh, to look at the, the overall RPC. We see an, a nice growth again this year um, versus Q1 um, last year. And maybe just uh, to, to conclude, um, if you compare um, the growth in Q1 2020 uh, with Q1 2021, the delta uh, you see in that growth is completely uh, uh, linked to the, the E-Press uh, impact that is now fully uh, embedded, of course, in the Q1 uh, results of consumer. Mm -hmm. um, good afternoon, uh, Nicolas. So as to your question on the evolution of uh, the labor cost, uh, last year on, on the 1st of March, our FFP uh, program, so Fit for Purpose program, uh, started off, and so we had a very important reduction in, uh, in headcount. And so, of course, this quarter uh, we are still benefiting from two months of uh, savings related to this FFP headcount uh, reduction. Um, 
and uh, going forward, uh, this uh, this advantage will disappear. Um, and as to the indexation, the last indexation of our labor uh, costs was last year in April 2020. And for this year, according to the latest provisions, we're not foreseeing any um, further uh, indexation. According to the latest um, provisions, our next indexation is at the moment foreseen as of uh, the 1st of Jan 2022. So does it mean that in absolute numbers, uh, the uh, labor cost should be similar in the, in, the, in the coming next quarters to the one we have in Q1? Indeed. Um. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next question from Rusten Rajesh from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Oh, great. Uh, afternoon. Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, it's three uh, very quick ones from me, actually. Um, on the B2B transformation, is it possible to just get a sense how far through, I guess I do appreciate it's early, early in that stage, but how far through you are in the renegotiation and the repricing of the contracts um, and maybe migration of the contracts uh, for your customers? Uh, secondly, sticking with uh, B2B, I think you mentioned up front there was some contribution um, in ICT from um, um, from some of the COVID centers uh, and providing data services for the immunization process. It's possible to again, quantify that, uh, how much that was this quarter. Um, and lastly, on the consumer side, uh, just to confirm the 73,000 uh, fiber connections, um, that's all done via Proximus. Uh, I think you said that the approval process for FiberClar has been achieved. Should we, uh, can we anticipate any contribution from the JV impacting the Q2 numbers or would that come uh, in the second half of the year? Thank you. So I'll take, uh, I'll take two and three, uh, your number two and number three question. And, and Sophie, I will let you answer the first question. Um, uh, so on, on your, um, on your question around uh, the contribution in terms of revenue for the uh, for the implementation of the of the COVID, vac COVID vaccination centers, honestly, this is uh, uh, not something that, that we want to disclose. Uh, but the, the good thing is around the perception of the brand, and we are uh, it's very good for uh, uh, for perception to help also uh, 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 Belgium in that difficult times. But we we are not doing that for uh, for generation of uh, uh, of revenues, and, and 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 this is you know more. Uh, Helping the country fighting against the pandemic than you know any other things, uh, but we believe this is quite important uh, in those in those times. On, on number three, uh, really rapidly, uh, um, it's only uh, the, uh, the, the the proximus standalone uh, um, fiber rollout that we that we see. Uh, uh, in that quarter, and, and it's going to be the same for the next quarter. This, is a, the, this ramp up is really fully uh, fueled by the own uh, Proximus standalone uh, uh, fiber rollout. And, uh, and Sophie, if you can answer the first question. Yes, of course. Thank you, Guillaume. Um, so, to your first question, I think which was related to where we were in terms of our transformation and how far we were in terms of the repricing and renegotiations of contracts. As you said yourself, um, it, 2021 is the execution year of our transformation. And as you can imagine, it's very important that we strike the right balance, managing on the one hand our customers moving towards next generation technologies such as SD1 or others, whilst still ensuring we're managing the value of our existing business as much as possible. And as you could see uh, in the numbers, all technologies such as fixed voice is actually ramping up. And I think that the Q Q1 numbers testify to uh, this careful uh, management. Now, to give you an illustrative example as to how we're managing this transformation is we've identified and segmented our customers in cohorts to accelerate selectively the migration to new technologies, proactively accelerating this migration of the early adopters first, whilst making sure we also keep an eye on the future technologies of the market and ramp up as and when needed. I think you also heard from Guillaume in his introduction that our transformation is about ensuring the convergence of traditional telco with, ICT, with IT solutions and customer value propositions that are answering our customers' requirements, such as, for example, secure connectivity to the cloud, 
voice as part of the advanced workplace proposition, 5G, IoT, edge use cases, etc. And the operating model that we've put in place in March of this year enables this approach. Now, to your specific questions on the repricing and renegotiation of the contract, as you know, those contracts have different year terms, and therefore it's very difficult to be able to talk generically about contracts who could be of a different year term and therefore would be renewed um, in, a different, in different times. So I can't really answer that question in detail, but hopefully I've given you the gist as to how we're managing our transformation today and moving forward. And just just uh, just uh, so to add to what Anne Sophie uh, uh, is saying, so far we 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 still feel confident that uh, you know the uh, the 2023 horizon to uh, to a profitable growth for a B2B segment is still um, uh, uh, reachable. Yeah, absolutely. We're committing to ensuring um, the commitment that we took at the Capital Markets Day to be back to growth in 2023. Indeed, Dio, I should have added it. Okay, no, that's great. Thank you, thank you for that. Thank you. And next question now from Naya Pamchet from Sibi. Please go ahead. Hi. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, I have two questions, please. Uh, what is your view on fiber, um, returns on fiber, especially in Flanders, where you have a lower market share? Returns are based on utilization and hence dependent on wholesale as well. And in this respect, Telenet doesn't seem keen to take wholesale from Proximus and also a pair focused on keeping Orange Belgium as a wholesale partner. So do you see this as a risk and affecting returns? And the second question is, you're building 2.2 million homes with own build, out of which 0.6 million is Brussels. That leaves you with 1.6 million homes to be built in the dense areas of Bologna and Flanders. Would you be open to using the Telenet network on wholesale basis in Flanders and the dense areas and focus building more on, in Bologna where network competition may arise if WU is acquired and restructured, which is expected in the near term? Thank you. On the on the first on the first question on the uh, on the returns in, you know of, of fiber investment in Flanders, um, uh, as as we said uh, several times, uh, the, the the return of investment uh, is depending of a lot of different factors, uh, and as you know, uh, the the Proximus standard rollout will you know focus on the city centres and the dense areas, uh, where uh, 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 we see a lot of opportunities to uh, uh, to bring a, a, a fiber superiority compared to um, uh, to uh, and, 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 and that uh, the speed in we, uh, with which we are rolling out fiber is also you know, shown in the numbers that we just shared uh, for Q1, but it's going to be on, on accelerated trends for the coming quarters. There is a, there is a product superiority, and, and, and fiber will, you know, will demonstrate that uh, in Belgium as it has demonstrated that uh, uh, product superiority in other geographies. And, and you can see that in, uh, in customer traction, customer churn, uh, 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 NPS for uh, for uh, uh, for existing customers on on the fiber network of Proximus. So we, we are really confident that we will uh, attract more customers, and we we will also increase the stickiness uh, of the of the customer base, and at the same time in, in increase uh, the value of every customer connection. Uh, uh, that's for the city centers, dense areas, and 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 you know for the moment. We are really on track with that um, uh, with that uh, ambition. Um, so that's one. Uh, second, uh, indeed, we are rolling out an open network. It means that we are welcoming, which is new for us. We are welcoming uh, 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 any operators that would be willing to get access to fiber connectivity. Uh, uh, going forward, and, and that's a new thing because we can do that with using fans in dense areas. We can also use that using the P2P uh, uh, architecture that we're going to be rolling out in the less dense areas with, with our JV partners, and uh, and again uh, that will uh, create some additional revenue opportunity to increase the return of the uh, of the fiber investment of Proximus. And also, very, one thing which is really important to, to keep in mind, we are not protecting any wholesale fixed revenue on our copper network because our competition today is on coax. So it means that compared to also uh, 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 other incumbent operators, we are in a much better shape to really get a strong return of the fiber investment on the long run because we have no, at, no protection of any existing uh, uh, fixed internet uh, wholesale revenue for the moment. 
the second and 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 and, and uh, the combination of the, those two elements. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, if we maintain the speed to roll out the network, that first mover advantage on the long term, on the long term, will be a key success factor for us. And 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 of course. Uh, we could have Obel as a wholesale partner. We could have uh, also uh, our friends from, from the cable at some point from some regions uh, also uh, uh, welcome on our networks. We will see. Um, it's too soon to, uh, to today to, to commit on that, but there is, you know, a, a rationality uh, to find a, a, a structure where uh, we avoid to destroy value on the Belgian market, and that's really what we are aiming at. So... Uh, uh, and last point, we are not going to compete on price. Uh, we are not competing on price. We will compete on product superiority uh, because we want to behave rationally, uh, rationally as, a, uh, as an incumbent operator. So I think the combination of this uh, approach, the speed, uh, the first mover advantage, and the openness of the network will ensure that we're going to drive very nice return on our fiber investment. Uh, as far as your uh, question around uh, 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 Wallonia, uh, um, I think this is the same story. I think we, we will, you know, first roll out the network in dense areas because this is where we do think this is uh, 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 easy for us to um, first to to to, uh, to reach as many customers as possible and, and with a, a very nice uh, return as well. So we we will focus the standalone Proximus rollout in Brussels and city centers of uh, Wallonia and Flanders, and then uh, for the less dense areas we will uh, uh, rely uh, on 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 a joint rollout uh, with our uh, partners. Uh, equity in the north and, and, and Eurofiber on time in the south. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Next question from David Wagman from ONG. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, first on fiber and the activation rate uh, of, of fiber clients in Q1, what is your view? Uh, and uh, basically, how do you think you could accelerate uh, in the coming quarters or in the coming years? Is there, are there any change needed or you, yeah. And then uh, still as a quick follow up on this one, are you getting any closer to, to signing both in the client? Um, then second question uh, on mobile Viking, could you explain us what are the regulatory hurdles you face uh, with this acquisition? And explain us basically why you think you have a very strong case uh, with the antitrust authorities uh, to get the deal approved. I have, of course, in mind the uh, you know the sale of of Mobile Viking by Telenet as a remedy uh, to have its acquisition of Base approved. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, David uh, Jim Castillo. So, on your first question, um, first of all, I think uh, from a consumer consumer side, uh, we are very happy. Uh, with the acceleration uh, of the network team uh, in the deployment uh, of fiber. Um, of course, as you know, there's a timing difference uh, between the moment uh, that we pass homes with fiber and then the moment uh, that those areas are ready for commercial activity. Uh, but when I look at uh, both the, the fiber deployments we have done in uh, 2018, 2019, 2020, and the way we have been activating those areas um, also in Q1, uh, we are on track um, with uh, the plans that we have uh, presented to you uh, in January. So uh, we're really, uh, really comfortable and really satisfied with the commercial performance that we have uh, in line with the deployment rate that we are doing. And that, and that, that, that means targeting the 50, 60 percent uh, take-up rate. Um, you have to um, disconnect the, um, the calculation of uh, active customers uh, divided by homes passed because there's a timing uh, delay uh, between, um, between both. And, of course, also in our commercial plans, uh, we are not going to activate everybody in the first uh, three months um, of a deployment uh, because we also, from an operational perspective, we manage um, that, uh, that part. So, um, as said, uh, when I look at uh, the plans that we have um, and that are in the the case for fiber, we're, we're really happy with uh, the performance that we see, um, and um, it's aligned with uh, the message that we gave in January, uh, where we see uh, in fiber areas the double as much uh, growth gains as we see on copper. Um, we also continue to see the, the better churn uh, in those fiber footprints also in Q1 
uh, this year versus uh, what we announced in January. And also on the ARPU uplift, we continue to see that 10% RPU uplift also in Q1, like we um, announced also in January. So for me, we're really, uh, um, with the numbers that you see here, I understand that it's, um, it can be um, a strange calculation to do, but um, when you take into account the, the timing delay between activating customers on a fiber network and the deployment of the fiber network, we're really on track uh, on that. Okay, David, and this is uh, Geert speaking. With respect to your uh, second question on wholesale, we definitely see very positive traction. In uh, the past days, we've signed the 31st uh, wholesale agreement uh, for fiber, and then, as Guillaume well explained, this is a fully open asset, and uh, we also are looking forward to further extend that also with uh, different sized of uh, partners as well. So um, overall, very positive traction. Um, so and then uh, with respect to uh, yeah, the speed, so first of all the standalone, but also with fiber class in uh, quarter four, we will start. You will see a starting uh, deploying as well there uh, through the fiber class GV. Thanks, both. And on the Mobile Vikings uh, acquisition, uh, I, I would not comment uh, because this is a, 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 you know ongoing discussion with the um, uh, with the competition authority. But we uh, we are quite confident. There is no uh, reason why we, we we would change an opinion on the good chance we have to to get uh, a clearance. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we should have some um, some news to share on the file before summer time. Thank you. Thank you. Next question from Emmanuel Carlier from Kempen. Please go ahead. Yes, hi. Good afternoon, all. Um, two questions from my side. Um, the first one is on um, the drop we have seen in customer relationships uh, on the consumer side. Uh, I think you lost something like 25 or 27K customers, I think, which is the highest number in many quarters. So could you explain us a little bit more why that is and how you expect to reverse that trend? That's question one. And the second one is with respect to the recent launch of uh, One uh, by Tinnenet. So I would love to hear your thoughts on this product and how you believe um, it will impact the market and Proximus uh, particularly. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Emmanuel. So on the on the first question um, on um, on the drop in customer relationships, so uh, this is uh, inherently linked uh, with the the acceleration we have seen in Q1 um, on the convergent uh, households, uh, where we see really uh, a consolidation um, of of mobiles uh, within the family. Um, and as you know, uh, in the past, uh, Proximus has a history of two companies uh, coming together. Um, so we still had customers that had a, a postpaid account um, on a separate um, customer account uh, that is now, uh, as part of the flex uh, convergence, uh, being brought together into uh, uh, the same customer um, account. So I think you see uh, you see an acceleration of, of that trend uh, due to the success of flex, where we see more and more mobiles within a family consolidating under one and the same uh, household account. On the, the yep. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. And then on the, the question of uh, Telenet. Um, so um, I, I would say that um, if you look at our pricing strat strategy, uh, we have quite a balanced uh, strategy already today in the market. Uh, we have on the one hand, on the one hand flex uh, that is really our, um, oriented towards families, uh, where we offer customers um, the, the possibility to really tailor their family needs uh, with a flex offer. And we, we know from market services that customers are really looking for that. On the other hand, uh, we have our Epic offer uh, that is tailored to the needs uh, of digital natives. And then with Scarlet, uh, we, ha we, we can target uh, the price seekers. So uh, when you look at, uh, at Telenet's offer, uh, the, their Telenet One um, is actually doing the same, but with, with one and the same uh, offer. Um, and it's not disrupting uh, the pricing strategies that we have already today um, within our current um, portfolio uh, when we address those three segments. Thank you. And don't you fear that 
more customers than before will move towards telenet because they offer higher speeds of course you're also working on that with uh, with the fiber rollout but that will take quite some years I think um, speed is, is one of the, the, the elements that uh, that comes into play. Uh, now, as you as you know, um, with Flex, um, we um, we already have a very successful offer in the market uh, already over the last um, over the last uh, year. Um, I think if you look at uh, the evolution of uh, the proximity netets on on internet over the last quarters, we have been really uh, performing very well. Also on our copper footprint, where uh, we have offers um, at the 100 megabits, so we really play on the different elements um, that um, that drive the choice of a of a customer when he has to choose a, a package which is no longer a telecom package, but which is really a package that uh, that is relevant in the daily digital life. is about entertainment, it's about digital press. So we have a lot of other assets uh, that we bundle in our flex offer, uh, and of course uh, the good news is that then on top of that, in fiber we can add. Additionally, um, also the, the speed element, and, and this is what we then see in fiber where we have um, uh, an even better performance on, on acquisition than we have in copper. So uh, I don't really see this uh, today uh, impacting um, the market because also that uh, additional speed is only available on the high end um, of, of, the, uh, of their prices. Um, so um, for me, um, I see this really as a value move uh, from Telenet, uh, not one to... Uh, to be aggressive in the market. Yeah, sorry, uh, I was too close to the mic. Yeah, it's, I, I, uh, I fully agree with um, uh, Jim's comment. If I can add, you know, one one element, I think this is good for the market that uh, uh, tiering based on technology is uh, what we uh, uh, what we push forward, both you know, uh, Tenet and Proximus, and then you know, this is really where I think the competition should uh, should focus, and this is I think for me a good sign that the the market is really driving for. Uh, you know, for good competition around the on the on the on the product, which is I think quite uh, uh, good to to have. It's much better to have a competition on pricing, uh, on the product quality and capabilities. But there again, I think this is not only around speed. Uh, uh, you have to uh, also consider that fiber is bringing much more than speed. Uh, uh, low latency, as you know, for gamer is quite important. For those who know what is uh, the difference in between a coax and a fiber network, they will know about the low latency capabilities of the fiber network. So that will drive, you know, the, uh, uh, the word of mouth uh, positively around the, the fiber rollout. This is one, and you know, you know, and, and you know that there is one gamer in every two home. Huh? So that's really. Uh, Something important. Uh, uh, so one, second, the stability of the network, uh, which is good uh, and better, way better on copper and fiber compared to uh, to coax. And the third element, and it's really important in COVID times, upload, upload capabilities. And you know that we, when you have to uh, to spend uh, ten hours on Teams, on Zoom, uh, and do video conferencing. The upload, upload uh, element is also quite important. So uh, uh, this is going to be a, a technology uh, a, a marketing uh, 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 and perception um, uh, battle. But, you know, I'm convinced we have the better product. So uh, at the end of the day, it will make the difference. Thank you. Thank you. Next question from Ulrich Harte from Jeffries. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much. I have two. The first one is on the um, flex proactive migration. I think you mentioned this also in the context of the um, of some um, RPC, RPC um, uh, dilution. Um, I was wondering what exactly does proactive migration mean? Do you send people offers and they take them up, or do you say, well, your contract on this tariff doesn't exist anymore and now you're on this tariff if you don't like it you're, you can quit or, or how exactly how exactly does this work and the second question is on um, telesign um, in your call on your call from February you sort of talked about Singe and Twilio as, as comparable companies um, and you sort of guided us to look at the valuations of Singe and Twilio um, could you maybe comment a bit, um, because you haven't in the past really highlighted Telesign and its business profile very much in detail, could you comment a little bit what the differences of Telesign versus Centrist Twilio might be, what might be unique about Telesign and different to these, uh, what you called comparables um, in February? Thank you very much. 
Hi, Ulrich. Uh, Jim uh, speaking. So on the first uh, question uh, with respect to uh, flex migrations, um, I would say that uh, it's a bit uh, the same approach like uh, Anne Sophie explained um, on the enterprise segment. So uh, we do value based migrations uh, where we look, of course, for opportunities within our, our current customer base um, to, um, to see where we can create additional value uh, for the company. We focus also a lot um, on mobile consolidation uh, within uh, within our households, and I would say that uh, when we look at um, at um, other types of migrations, um, the legacy migrations of the the real um, older um, packs is is also something that we continuously uh, look at because uh, we know that it drives uh, simplification, and thanks to that simplification, we can also have a positive impact on cost. So those migrations are really um, a mix of uh, commercial um, value-based migrations on the one hand, and then from an, uh, an, a legacy portfolio um, management perspective uh, to drive costs uh, down from a simplification perspective. Then to, uh, to your question around, around Telesign, I would like to, uh, to make a few, um, a few comments. So Telesign, they, they do operate in the digi digital identity market. Uh, that market is a $35 billion market. And in that market, we want to become a worldwide leader in connecting and protecting digital interactions between consumers and companies. But, but, but you know, uh, it's important that we um, uh, explain a, a little bit more. Uh, I think preventing fraud and securing digital interactions is not new. Uh, that's for sure and was of critical importance long before 2020. But what we believe is that the digital transformation also linked to the pandemic, uh, with individuals turning to tech to facilitate everyday tasks that they might have, uh, you know, uh, doing before uh, in person, mean that the role of telesign is going extremely central and more and more important. Uh, just, you know, one uh, striking example, cybercrime uh, uh, every year costs over $6 trillion globally. And, uh, and digital identity theft alone cost over $56 billion. So as more and more transactions happen online, I think the incentive from, you know, from fraudsters, cyber criminals is only getting bigger and bigger every day. So without solutions like Telesign, you know, those kind of losses could continue you know, for, uh, to grow and to, uh, to expand uh, uh, going forward. So what do companies want today? They want to balance the need to reduce the fraud losses while continuing to deliver a great customer experience. And honestly, I, I'm, we are also confronting to that at Proximus. It could be sometimes impossible problem to solve. Adding more security checks, balances, and, 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 and that may reduce fraud losses, but some, some, those same security measures can also be annoying and cumbersome for, for customers. So the role of Telesign is, is, is to help end that trade-off in between protection, fraud protection, and uh, seamless use of, uh, of services. That's why I'm, you know, I'm really, really convinced that the value we bring to customer, even if it's somehow different uh, from the, the people you mentioned, but there is no reason why we should see that the value that we bring to customers would not be at par with the, 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 the companies that you, that you mentioned. As we are right at that intersection in between communication and CPAS and digital identity. So that's really uh, what uh, is Telesign about. And what is our, you know, our secret sauce? What is the difference of Telesign? And, and, and I think we are really unique because we have insights of billions of phone numbers worldwide and associated communications metadata. That's the difference of Telesign. This data combined with our own expertise in terms of data science, creating of this uh, AI-based, machine learning-based uh, uh, scoring platform, that's what is the secret source of Telesign and create that compelling solution that is, you know, growing uh, at, uh, at, uh, uh, at booming trends, as you can see, uh, in, the, uh, in the result of last year and the uh, result of Q1. That's really what Telesign is about. That's why I'm, you know, so convinced that we can really further accelerate and create a lot of value uh, with uh, that, uh, that company.
That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next question from Ben Lyons from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Thank you for taking my questions. I have a few. Uh, the first is if you could just comment on the competitive environment at the moment in Belgium um, and what your 5G pricing strategy will be now that we're seeing the entrance of speed tiering on the mobile side. Uh, just a follow up on the telesign question as well is if you could um, give us any FX sensitivity and sort of the growth rate was, was impacted by, by currency. So that would be quite helpful. And lastly, on the working capital benefit, do you expect that to unwind over the, the rest of the year? Thank you. Hi, Ben. Uh, so Jim speaking. So on, on the, the question linked to, uh, to speed tiering um, today, um, and I think uh, like uh, Guillaume says, it's uh, good to see that um, other operators in Belgium is gonna, are going to follow the same path. If, if you look today on the consumer side, uh, the way we are monetizing 5G, um, 5G is only available on our high-end uh, mobile plans, and, and as, by doing so, uh, we have uh, today an implicit uh, tiering on speed. Um, as the 5G uh, speeds are only available um, on the uh, the two uh, most expensive uh, mobile plans um, for the consumer, and all the other ones are are on uh, are on 4G. Um, so um, so I would say that uh, it's good to see that uh, um, competition is also going to uh, drive the market uh, in the same in the same direction. So we can indeed uh, continue to build on on 5G capabilities to create value through uh, speed tiering. Yeah. On the, on the telesign growth rate, uh, I think we have been very clear in the, in the slides in the intro. Uh, uh, the, uh, on constant currency, uh, the growth over is uh, 45%. That the revenue growth of telesign, uh, uh, um, extremely the impact of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of the currency uh, uh, effect in between dollars and, and euros. And on the working cap, I will, I will uh, let... Uh, um, so the working capital effect of Q1 is indeed pure timing uh, difference, and so for the rest of the year we do expect that this benefit will unwind. Great, thank you. Thank you. We have one new question from Nicolas Cotcolisson from HSBC. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Two, two small ones. The first one is maybe a smaller issue, but I was wondering why such a fall in the advanced business services, because if anything, this should be a buoyant segment, so I'm a bit surprised. And sorry, an, another follow-up on Telesign, uh, because in the press release, you talk about a significant customer repricing effect, but still you're growing the business double digit. So can you help reconcile this? What's the balance between price and volume to get to that 44% growth? Thank you. First question, I think this is for Anne-Sophie. Yes, it's for me, indeed. Um, so I think your question, Nicolai, was related to the advanced business services and why yes. there was, um, well, as you know, this part of the business is actually very much impacted by, uh, by COVID. And this is why you see the decline in terms of, of revenue. And, and more specifically, on, uh, on certain elements that I will outline to you in a minute. Um, the elements that are impacted by COVID are pretty much um, linked to the fact that if you look at the different business drivers, um, we see that the business drivers are very much impacted by um, the, sorry, I'm just, my computer completely froze, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can, sorry, I'm just trying to uh, find. And I can uh, I can take the uh, the telephone question. Meanwhile, sure. uh, Nicola, uh, so that yeah, sorry, you can re, uh, yeah. restart your computer. Yeah. I'm uh, um, yeah. Uh, on the on the growth of telephone, it's 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 really volume driven for the moment. But at the same time, uh, uh, what we are trying to do uh, is more and more doing uh, uh, pox. Uh, so. Um, um, uh, proof, of con proof of concept uh, on, on, on a lot of, um, of these digit digital identity use cases at customers. That's why we, we also have a, a, a small dilution of the, 
of the direct margin because those books yet uh, uh, did not yet uh, deliver the um, uh, the value that uh, they will deliver going forward. So that's why really uh, uh, you see that uh, uh, that evolution in between um, uh, revenue and direct margin. So really, you know, driven by volume, but we are really now accelerating the, the ramp up of the of the of the pure digital identity use cases that will be really the uh, the fuel of the uh, of the growth for uh, the coming quarters uh, is going to be really uh, uh, seen as of next quarter and qu the quarters that are going to be uh, 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 following uh, this year but also for the years to come yeah thank you Guillaume. and apologies about this my computer is still not rebooting but i will i will search my brain to find the answer so, um, as you know, the uh, advanced business services is really um, the, the smart mobility revenue is impacted um, with uh, more specifically on the automotive and the parking revenues because, of course, they're highly exposed um, to COVID-19. So, the decline that you see is, li is linked to that, um, the exposure for COVID-19 on the automotive and uh, parking revenues. That makes sense. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. We have two other questions. One from Michael Bishop from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks. Thanks very much. I just wanted to follow up on this interesting telesign uh, discussion. Um, I think you've been in, in the local press, obviously suggesting that the value of telesign could be sort of unicorn type valuation. Um, but at the same time, if you sort of read the press release and, and also your comments, you've talked about the, the need to, to scale up. And therefore, I was just really wanted to ask sort of two things. You know, firstly, what do you think the sort of the, the reinvestment organically required is to really sort of scale up and in particular, you know, go outside of the US? And, and then secondly, if you look at a business like Cinch, you know, for the last sort of five, 10 years, they've done a, a, a huge amount of bolt on M&A in this space to basically build more global scale. And, and I appreciate you are slightly operating a, across different verticals, but you know, do, do you think you'll have to do quite a bit of bolt on M&A at, at Telesign to sort of drive similar scale, given this tends to be, you know, a, a global business with where sort of you know high volume, low cost of execution wins out, um, and then just secondly, following on the previous question, um, so are you suggesting that growth can accelerate from here, or or, the, or whether there was some sort of one time benefits to growth in the last couple of quarters from um, an increase in volumes? Thanks very much. So a lot, 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 of, lot, lot, lot of questions, but uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, I think the focus that we have today with Joe Burton, the new management that we put in place, uh, it's really to execute on the organic growth because now we, uh, we really want to take that, uh, that unique positioning in the digital identity space. So uh, that f the first focus of, of, the, of the moment, really to make sure that we can deliver that promise on, on, on fraud management, uh, fraud prevention, and, 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 and uh, on the digital identity space. And that will require some, uh, some, some strong execution focus uh, and, uh, 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 and some investment um, in, uh, in the product. That's why uh, uh, we, uh, we say that if we manage to execute quite well on those product investments that are not massive product investments, so do not be scared, but, uh, but we are in a very a nice situation because, you know, Telesign, despite the fast growth, is EBDA positive. Huh? They are generating EBDA, which is quite unique for a, a company that is, that is growing that fast. So we can use a part of that to reinvest in the product and also in the go-to-market. You know, in the software industry, uh, when you have a good product, you need, you know, good sales guys to, um, uh, to deliver the, the promise to the customers. So we need also to scale up the, uh, the, the go-to-market uh, and if you manage to do that, indeed, there is an opportunity to further accelerate the growth of the digital identity part. Uh, because today the mix is, is a mix of messaging and digital identity revenues within Telesign. And we want really to scale up the di digital identity part uh, so that we also uh, can improve uh, 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 significantly uh, the margin uh, of, the, uh, of the, the direct margin of the, of the company. So that's really the focus. If we can do that, you know, uh, everything would be then possible. Thank you. 
Thanks. And then just sorry, the second question was just, I guess, on the, the growth profile, if we think about, you know, the, the next year, could it accelerate? Because, you know, versus the sort of 45 percent that you've flagged on an organic basis or has it benefited from the uh, sort of higher volumes more recently that creates a tougher comp? As I said, you're going to see an acceleration of the revenue trend uh, of the of the of the of the, of the um, revenue trends on the digital identity segment. So you have revenue growth, but with a better mix. That's really what is going to happen in the coming years because the, the contribution of the digital identity part is going to be higher and higher going forward. That's really what will drive the value of the company. Great. Thanks for all the color. Appreciate it. Thank you. Last question for the moment registered is from Simon Coles from Barclays. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for taking the questions. It's just on the fiber injection. So obviously you had a startup on for the, the Flanders JV um, this quarter, and it's presumably there should be another one for the Wallonia JV at some point this year. I'm just wondering, is that enough to cover the JVs for, say, the next one or two years? Because I remember you saying before that the fiber injection the equity injections for the fiber JVs were, were back end loaded, or should we consider it as sort of you need the smaller ones for the next couple of years and then the bigger ones come in as uh, as the fiber rollouts really ramp up? Thank you. Um, so, uh, Simon, um, so right now we have done equity injections in uh, in fiber, uh, Clark, in uh, Q1. And so going forward, um, as soon as um, the GV with Eurofiber will be approved, uh, we will, of course, have as well have to make equity injections. Uh, but given the fact that the the coverage of this uh, GV will be smaller than one of uh, fiber, Clark, the size of the GV tickets in uh, this GV will be proportionally smaller. And then, of course, like we said, uh, the GVs, they will fund as well with debt. 70% of uh, the cash need of those GVs will be funded with debt, and the rest will be funded with, uh, with EBITDA. And, of course, the need for debt of those GVs, that will be depending on the further rollout of those GVs. Okay, but if we took, say, the 30 million and, and, and gross that up for what EQT would put in and, and the debt that you'll generate, that would suggest that you could probably cover sort of a couple of hundred thousand households. So you're good in, the, in, in say, the Flanders JV for the next couple of years. Um, and then in 23 or 2024, that's when the big injections start happening or the bigger injections start happening. Um, so, um, so, um, so the right there will be debt uh, in first instance, and the debt at the level of those GVs that will be at their balance sheet, and so that will not be consolidated uh, in our uh, debt. And so, indeed, the f next uh, equity injection that will need to be done uh, will be uh, done once that uh, new cohort will be uh, completely rolled out by uh, by those GVs. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We don't have any more questions registered for the moment, ladies and gentlemen. If you wish to ask a question, you have to press 01 on your telephone keypad at 0 and 1 on your telephone keypad. It looks like we don't have any more questions. Back to you for the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you all for your participation. I wish you a lovely weekend. And for any follow-ups, you can contact the Investor Relations team. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you all for attending Numenau Disconnect Your Line.